Okay. Welcome to the Rise Up webinar series hosted by Hydrocephalus Canada and Association de Spina Bifida et de Hydrocephaly du Quebec. I'm Shauna Baudouet, Director of Programs and Information for Hydrocephalus Canada, Lawrence Lessier, Executive Director, and Margot, I'm not going to be able to say your last name, Margot. <laughs> she is the Mobilization and Events Coordinator of Association de Spina Bifida et de Hydrocephalus du Quebec, who are also with us today. This collaborative webinar aims to overcome the language barriers of our two communities and gives French and English speaking Canadians the opportunity to access up-to-date information and benefit from the expertise of health specialists in the care of people with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Today's event will be recorded for future access available on both organizations' YouTube channels Participants, cameras, and speakers will not be available during the webinar. To submit questions, please use the chat feature or email info at hydrocephalus.ca or info at spina.qc.ca. This is a bilingual event. Please ensure you have selected the correct language to view this webinar and the chat feature. To do so, click on the interpretation image. It looks like a little globe down at the bottom of your page or your screen and select your preferred language of English or French to be on the right channel. Okay. Do you wanna wait a few more minutes before you start Dr. Berndel or do you wanna go ahead? It's, it's up to you. If you wanted to give it a few more moments so that people can log on, that's great. Otherwise okay. I'm happy to start now. Okay, I'll continue with the introduction and then uh, we'll start. Today we are very excited and honored to have Dr. Ann Berndel, a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto with us for this presentation. Dr. Berndel is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and an associate scientist at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. She is the director of the Accessible Care Pregnancy Clinic, the first clinic in North America to provide pregnancy care and special, sorry, to provide pregnancy care specifically for women with physical disabilities. Her research focuses on physical disability and pregnancy, as well as cervical ripening methods. Today, Dr. Berndel will be discussing health issues for girls and women with spina bifida, focusing on pregnancy and childbirth and highlighting the newly new recently published women's health guidelines for, for people with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Welcome, Dr. Berndel. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be presenting and I'm really excited that we're able to do this in two languages as well. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the goals of the presentation for today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the need for guidelines uh, in the field of pregnancy and spina bifida and how they were developed. Uh, I'm going to talk about these guidelines in a consumer focused manner. And I realize that we have a, a mixed group in terms of people who are attending today. So we have some people who are care providers uh, or have a medical background. Uh, and then we also have a number of people who have spina bifida and have questions about pregnancy and spina bifida. So I'm going to try to present it in a way that's relevant for, for all people who are attending. Um, at the end of the presentation, I wanna talk about some resources that are available, both for people with spina bifida who are considering a pregnancy, uh, as well as the clinicians who are caring for those individuals. So uh, these guidelines for the care of people with spina bifida was uh, developed uh, with the Spina Bifida Association, uh, which is an American, American group uh, that focuses on spina bifida. Um, I wanna talk about why we needed to do this. So healthcare providers, we know from uh, a number of different papers, uh, may not be trained specifically to care for women with physical disabilities. So there is this, this gap that's there. There also has been some documentation that healthcare providers can lack confidence in caring for pregnant people with physical disabilities, which makes sense if they don't have the training um, to feel confident to do that. 
Um, when we do guidelines, we can improve a standardized approach. So that means that people, regardless of where they're living, um, that they're more likely to get a similar approach to care and so to get more even care. And it also lets clinicians and researchers know where there's gaps in the literature. So where should we be putting more efforts in terms of learning more to make sure we can provide good care? Something that I think is, is really reassuring and exciting um, is that we've done other research and we found that clinicians want to learn more and become better at caring for people with physical disabilities during pregnancy. And this is based on, on data from residents in obstetrics and gynecology in Canada, um, that there really is a desire to learn more. So we're hoping that with improved curriculum, there'll be just more well-trained clinicians who can care for people with spina bifida during their pregnancies. The important thing about people with spina bifida um, is that spina bifida, of course, has a number of specific health concerns, and they're really quite varied from individual to individual with spina bifida. But these health concerns can impact pregnancy from the preconception time frame all the way to delivery and in the postpartum as well. An important thing to know is that more people with spina bifida are having babies. So this is some data from Quebec showing that there's an increase in people who are mothers with spina bifida giving birth. And in terms of looking at this graph, the black line um, is the number and the uh, two dotted lines are the, uh, the 95th centile around that. So in terms of developing these guidelines, uh, this was done with support for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, and the Spina Bifida Association together. Um, it was first put out uh, as a series of guidelines in 2003, and this current iteration uh, is the fourth revision. It took a very long time. It was a, a very, very big project. Um, we did three years of planning. We had a number of meetings, literature review. And something that I think was really important about this is that there were consumer representatives that were an important part of this development, meaning individuals with spina bifida were reviewing the clinical questions that we were asking to make sure that they were questions that were relevant to the lives of people with spina bifida. Uh, so these are the authors on the guidelines. So myself, uh, Dr. Margaret Nosek and Dr. Ashley Waddington. Um, this was a huge guideline. Um, there were 58 different recommendations that were made and it looked throughout the lifespan. Um, however, today, because I'm an obstetrician, uh, I'm going to be talking about antenatal care, which means prenatal care, care surrounding birth and breastfeeding. So the most important part uh, when you're thinking about becoming pregnancy is the planning itself. And I recommend that if you're an individual with spina bifida and considering pregnancy, um, that you have a preconception consultation. And uh, the people that you should probably be talking to is either a maternal fetal medicine specialist or an obstetrician uh, who's in your area. Um, and many people may also find it beneficial to speak to their neurologist or their urologist or their physiatrist, depending on what health concerns you have beforehand um, to make sure that you're in optimal health when you enter pregnancy. And preconception consultation has been found to be beneficial for people who have a number of different health concerns, just to make sure that you're in your best health as possible uh, when you're starting your pregnancy. The other thing that's important for people with spina bifida is they start supplementing with folic acid, four to five milligrams a day, three months prior to conception. And you'll see that it's the four to five milligrams and they're both okay to do. And that just depends on the formulation that you're taking. So spina bifida and pregnancy, there's a lot of impacts that pregnancy can have on the bodies of people with spina bifida. And again, the thing that I, that I wanna reiterate is just how varied uh, the health of people with spina bifida is and how it can change through their lifespan. Um, and also how everyone's gonna have different aspects of their health that they're more concerned about. But when you're thinking about pregnancy, that some of the major issues that we might be talking about to make sure that you're in optimal health um, are concerning your breathing, um, changes in mobility or pain, uh, bowel changes, your bladder and kidney health, um, concerns surrounding the shunt, um, and increased seizure frequency. So these are some big things to talk about and think about uh, during pregnancy. So from a respiratory change perspective, uh, we do know that people who use wheelchairs routinely, as well as people who have scoliosis, may have changes in breathing during pregnancy. And this can be associated with the restricted space. So this doesn't mean it's going to happen to everyone, but there is an increased chance of this happening. 
We also know that some people who have significant restriction of their breathing can impact the timing and mode of delivery for those individuals. So the recommendation is that we do some pulmonary function testing at least once during pregnancy for individuals who use a wheelchair routinely or have scoliosis. Uh, in the clinic that I run, uh, in conjunction with the respirologist that I work with, uh, we've decided that we'll do screening at around 28 weeks, which is as we enter into the third uh, trimester. Uh, but if there's any concerns before that, then of course we would do the screening earlier. Changes in mobility and pain. So a number of people do uh, experience these changes. And some people need to be changing the type of mobility device or supportive uh, device that they're using during their pregnancy or have to have their wheelchair refit. So for example, this might mean that someone um, who is using a brace may also use a cane during the pregnancy for extra support. Um, we might have someone who chooses to go from using uh, canes to using a scooter, for example, for distances. Um, it's really to just make sure that uh, people are feeling comfortable. It can help with pain for some people, and it's an important part of fall reduction. So during pregnancy, it's normal that joints become looser, and that's just some of the hormonal changes that are there, and the center of gravity also shifts, and this predisposes all people to falls. If someone has weakness in a certain area or difficulty moving, um, then that would increase the risk of falls as well. So we're trying to help decrease the risk of falls, but also make sure that people are feeling comfortable. Um, if people are having increased pain, some people also benefit from massage therapy or physiotherapy. Um, often physiotherapy is working in conjunction with occupational therapy, uh, and that's helpful both for before and after delivery as well. Um, in our clinic at Sunnybrook, uh, we work with a anesthetist who specializes in chronic pain in pregnancy and can help some individuals who are having significant pain concerns. So bowel changes. Uh, pregnancy is a time of bowel changes for everyone. Um, the motility of your bowel slows during pregnancy. So some of the pregnancy hormones slow the rate of emptying. And so people tend to feel more bloating and experience constipation. So from the beginning, a lot of people just try some diet changes to help with constipation concerns. So, you know, water, high fiber diet, uh, lots of fruits and veggies can be very helpful. Um, some people do need more than that, and uh, you know, stool softeners are safe, laxatives are safe. Um, however, some of, especially the laxatives, can cause like a bloating feeling or cramping, um, and that can be uncomfortable for some people. For people who are having significant concerns with constipation, um, some people may need to work with a gastroenterologist as well. So, bladder and kidney concerns. Um, Many people with spina bifida do have concerns with their bladder and kidney health. Um, and so from a, from a guideline perspective, it's important that clinicians are asking about ability to catheterize or what they're doing for their uh, bladder management. And if there's concerns surrounding catheterization, um, it's important to work with the urologist and get them to see someone as soon as possible uh, because there can be poor drainage as the uterus is growing. Um, some people also find that they have troubles with self-catheterization, especially as the uterus is growing and it just gets more and more difficult to reach and, and perform catheterization. Um, one of the major worries is developing bladder infections. So in pregnancy, bladder infections don't always feel the same as bladder infections outside of pregnancy. Uh, and we know that sometimes they're asymptomatic. So we do generally try to treat asymptomatic bacteria um, because it can progress to become a bladder infection or a kidney infection uh, as well. We know that kidney infections increase the risk of preterm birth. So it's important that we're screening and paying attention to any signs or symptoms. When we're looking at what happens to, to bladders during pregnancy, there's not a ton of data specific to spina bifida. Um, at bladder changes, um, sometimes we need to extrapolate from some of the information on, on people with spinal cord injuries. Um, when we're looking at people with spinal cord injury, it looks like many women, so 45% of people did need to change their bladder routine during pregnancy. Um, many people needed to increase their frequency of catheterization. 
and about a fifth of people had to change to using an indwelling catheter during pregnancy as well. Um, and more than a third of people uh, developed incontinence during pregnancy. So, so bladder health um, is a major concern um, during pregnancy for people with spina bifida who have bladder concerns. Um, when we're looking uh, at uh, complications compared to people who don't have spinal cord injuries, um, which is in this data our substitute for people with spina bifida, um, the, the major worries of course are the infections. When we're looking at acute cystitis, which means an acute bladder infection, if you don't have um, a spinal cord injury, about one to 4% of people have one. Um, but if you do have a spinal cord injury, uh, then the risk is 64%. And if you have an indwelling catheter, that, that risk is 100%. So we're really concerned about bladder infections associated um, with catheterization use. Um, there's also a greater risk of having recurrent uh, over and over again, um, more than three of them uh, bladder infections. And significantly, there's an increased risk of pyelonephritis, um, which is a kidney infection. And uh, for women who have paraplegia, the risk is 7% and it's 35% in women with tetraplegia. And that's concerning not only because of the preterm birth risk, um, but of course, uh, because of the discomfort associated with uh, having a kidney infection and possibly needing to be hospitalized associated with that. Bladder management uh, in pregnancy, uh, there's, again, there's not a ton of uh, data, but I tried to organize some of it uh, just to get a sense of it. There's only been one prospective trial looking at management of uh, chronic um, uh, bacteria in pregnancy in people with spinal cord injuries. And what they did was they were continually cycling different uh, antibiotics throughout the pregnancy. And then in this very small trial of only six people, they saw that all the babies were born at term, which is a good thing, um, and there were no kidney infections. So although this is really good news, I think it's really hard to say how effective this is because it's such a small, small group of people. Um, in terms of the in and out catheterization, um, we know that there is that increased risk of bladder infections. Um, with the indwelling catheters, about 100% of people are gonna get a bladder infection. And some people also get bladder spasms. Um, in terms of medications and treatment, uh, oxybutyn and desmopressin are category B, uh, which is most medications are actually in category B, uh, which means that it appears to be uh, safe in pregnancy, but we don't have prospective trials for it. Uh, for Botox, there's really limited evidence and is considered category C, which means you should be having a, a conversation about risks and benefits. Um, but it's not necessarily absolutely contraindicated. Uh, and neuromodulators, there's really not a, not a lot of data uh, surrounding the use of those in pregnancy. So I'm gonna shift a little bit and, and talk about renal function. Um, and this is a really important aspect of pregnancy care. So ideally before someone becomes pregnant, they'll have baseline renal assessment done. Um, and this is because if you do have a concern with your kidney function, um, you need to be uh, monitored in conjunction with nephrology during your pregnancy. And this is because renal dysfunction um, increases uh, the risk of small babies, uh, preterm delivery and preeclampsia, which is a pregnancy specific health concern. And there are some people who have a very poor renal uh, function at the beginning of the pregnancy and they may have permanent deterioration of renal dysfunction uh, following pregnancy. So it's really important to get a sense of where you're at with your renal function um, to help make educated choices surrounding pregnancy and monitoring. So shunts, um, there are cases reported of shunt obstruction during pregnancy associated with the growing uterus, but there's really different reported rates in the literature. So it's, it's challenging to say what uh, the rate of that occurring is. The symptoms of shunt obstruction are headaches and nausea and increased blood pressure. And this is challenging because it looks a lot like preeclampsia. If someone were to have a shunt obstruction uh, during pregnancy, they would need multidisciplinary management, meaning discussing with the neurosurgeon um, as well as their obstetrician about what the right next steps are for that individual. Uh, seizures. Um, so ideally, if you're an individual who has seizures, uh, uh, you've done some preconceptual counseling and spoken to your neurologist, and you're on a single agent, if possible, 
and as stable as possible from a seizure perspective prior to pregnancy. During pregnancy, you'll also need to be monitored by your neurologist if you are someone who has seizures um, because there's an increased risk of seizures in pregnancy. And that's because your blood volume changes during pregnancy. Um, some people have significant nausea and vomiting during pregnancy and so are just not able to keep some of their medications down. Uh, sleep deprivation is really common in pregnancy, stress and anxiety, and these are things that all lower the seizure threshold. Um, so some people do find they have an increased uh, number of seizures in pregnancy. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit now about pregnancy specific concerns. So before I was talking more about things that might impact uh, the, the health of that individual in terms of pre-existing concerns um, for, for their body and their body's function. Um, and now talk a little bit about things that are more specific to the pregnancy itself. So in people with spina bifida, there is an increased risk of structural concerns in babies. Um, there does appear to be an increased risk of preterm birth. And again, in people with renal dysfunction, um, there would be an increased risk of preeclampsia. So when I'm talking about the increased risk of structural concerns, um, I want to just really iterate that uh, the choice of prenatal screening is very personal and people feel really differently about it. Uh, so you need to feel empowered to ask about having a screening or, or say that you're not interested in screening depending on where you're coming from and what your choices are. Um, but I'm gonna just talk about what the options are here so that you have that knowledge. So some people choose to undergo screening because it provides them reassurance that everything is normal. Um, they, there is a possible option of intrauterine therapy. So when uh, spina bifida in a fetus is detected early on, there may be a chance for surgery that can improve the well-being of that baby um, after birth. And so some people want to know about that and have those choices and options. Um, and there's also, some people find it beneficial to just have knowledge and be prepared uh, prior to birth. It can be helpful for birth and neonatal planning. And some people might use this information uh, to make choices surrounding continuation of the pregnancy. Some people don't wanna do screening and that's okay too. Um, you know, screening for some people causes increased stress and anxiety. And if someone is having invasive testing, it can increase the risk of pregnancy loss. I'm going to go through this uh, just briefly. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is because some older literature sometimes discusses the need for invasive testing if you're screening specifically for uh, spina bifida, but that is not currently the case. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that you can do that screening without anything invasive. So right now, and I'm talking from Ontario, this is what we're doing. People in different locations may have slightly different uh, screening protocols and that's okay too. Um, but right now, all pregnant people, uh, we offer a first trimester screen, which is an ultrasound plus blood work. And that's looking for uh, different chromosomal concerns. We also offer everyone a 20 week anatomy scan. Um, and this is a head to toe examination of the baby that's looking for structural concerns as well as concerns surrounding the placenta. In uh, pregnant people with spina bifida, it would be also reasonable to offer an early anatomy scan. Um, and that's something that we do at Sunnybrook and a number of other centers are doing this as well. Um, and that is being able to do the majority of the anatomy scan early on. And some people find this beneficial uh, to know about the well being of their baby and about any structural concerns earlier in the pregnancy rather than later. But you would still do the other aspects of the screening the first trimester screen and the 20 week anatomy scan. If you were over 40 years old, um, the, uh, instead of doing the first trimester screen, uh, we would offer NIPT, which is again, a non-invasive screening. And this is blood work um, and then the ultrasounds that would go along with that as well. And it's just more accurate for, for people who are over 40. Over on the other side of the chart, you'll see where it says CVS, which is chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis. And those are both invasive uh, types of uh, testing and they're considered diagnostic for chromosomal and genetic concerns but it's not what we're using to screen for, for spina bifida. So the take home message here um, is that the gold standard for screening for spina bifida related structural concerns is ultrasound, so a non-invasive screening test. I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about preterm labor um, because it does appear that there's an increased risk of late preterm birth in people with spina bifida. So late preterm birth means preterm birth between 
34 and 37 weeks of gestational age. Delivery after 37 weeks is considered term. Why do people with spina bifida have an increased risk of preterm birth? It might be related to the increased risk of bladder and kidney infections. Um, it may be associated uh, with an increased risk of having uh, a malarian abnormalities of the uterus, meaning that some people might have a heart-shaped uterus um, or have uh, sort of looks like two uteruses fused together. And those types of uteruses, people who have those types of uteruses um, are at, at greater risk of preterm birth. So we don't know the reason, but it might be because of some of those concerns. Um, there have been uh, some suggestions that for people uh, with spinal cord injury, as well as people with spina bifida, um, have serial vaginal examinations after 28 weeks to assess for dilation, which would be a way of seeing if there uh, appears to be a risk for preterm birth, but there's no data right now that's, that's supporting that as a, as a method of uh, screening for all people. Um, in terms of preterm labor, uh, some people uh, who have spina bifida might not be aware of labor contractions. So people have different uh, degrees of sensitivity. Um, and so sometimes it's good to talk about other ways that you may detect contractions. So some people just have abnormal pains or sensations. Um, some people notice a change in spasticity uh, when they're contracting. Um, people have bladder spasms. Um, depending on where the person's lesion is, uh, they may develop autonomic dysreflexia symptoms. Um, some people might just notice a splash that their, that their water has broken, and some people may have no symptoms as well. So preeclampsia, um, this is a pregnancy specific condition. So it only happens when you're pregnant. Uh, and the characteristics of preeclampsia are high blood pressure. Um, people get headaches, they get visual changes like spots in front of their eyes. They feel nauseated, they throw up, sometimes they get pain in through their upper abdomen, um, short of breath, and really the only treatment for this condition is delivery. Um, we do try when people are preterm to delay delivery if it's safe to do, but sometimes it can't be. Um, the thing that's really challenging about preeclampsia in people with spina bifida is that the symptoms are very similar to a shunt occlusion and autonomic dysreflexia. So it's really important whether you're a clinician caring for someone uh, with spina bifida, or if you're an individual with spina bifida, to be aware of these things so that you can seek help and, and have them assessed. So we got a lot of questions, and I'm going to go into more detail about this because of these questions about mode of delivery. There is no, you know, one size fits all um, mode of birth that's best for people with spina bifida. Um, and this is really for so many reasons. Uh, and really it has to be an individualized care plan uh, for each person, um, thinking through that person's health, um, thinking about their personal feelings and preferences uh, and thinking about their choices. Some of the aspects that I think are really important to discuss are anesthesia options. So uh, it's sometimes felt that people who have spina bifida cannot have an epidural or spinal analgesia, um, and that's not so. So it doesn't mean that it's always possible, but it doesn't mean that it's always impossible either. So someone who has spina bifida should meet with an anesthetist beforehand um, and discuss what their, their pain control options are in labor or if there was an emergency. Um, there's some discussion that people who have a VP shunt should have delayed pushing or no pushing. That doesn't mean you have to have a C-section um, if you have a shunt. Um, we can help people who uh, have a shunt and if their neurologist feels they should have delayed pushing or, or minimal pushing, um, we can assist at the end with vacuum or forceps. And so that would be something to discuss um, with your obstetrician and your neurologist if you do have a shunt. Uh, people who have previous urological surgeries or abdominal surgeries, uh, this can be a, a detailed conversation just surrounding what those surgeries were, um, what type of scar tissue might be there, um, you know, and what would be the best case scenario for that person? Would it be better to plan for a trial of vaginal delivery and have a backup plan um, with a urologist available because of an increased risk of trauma to a previous urological surgery? Um, or would they prefer a planned cesarean section um, when people are not in an emergency uh, situation where risk to damage to those structures would be less? So these are some, some difficult and sort of complex conversations that often 
require a lot of players there. Um, but this is part of why it wouldn't be sort of a one size fits all answer for people in terms of uh, what is the, the right mode of delivery for them. Another important aspect is skeletal structure. So some people with spina bifida do have changes in their pelvis that might make vaginal birth more challenging. Um, I often examine people in the third trimester um, if they're thinking about uh, a vaginal delivery and they're concerned about their skeletal structure, uh, just to assess and see if it feels like a baby's head would fit. Um, another key aspect is what happens in an emergency. So um, if there was an emergency situation, how do people feel about uh, for example, if they needed an emergency general anesthesia, um, you know, these are some of those, those conversations that, that help to uh, decide what the right next steps are. So postpartum, um, you know, feeding the baby is one of the major, major things that happens afterwards. And when you have a newborn baby, they really do eat every two to three hours. So this is a major aspect of people's lives um, after they have their baby. Um, the, the guideline uh, statement is that we should encourage women who wish to breastfeed to do so um, and provide them with support from a lactation consultant. Uh, we do know from the literature that people with physical disabilities have lower rates of breastfeeding than people uh, without physical disabilities. And it's felt that this might be multifactorial, you know, it may be due to uh, lack of support, uh, people feeling quite fatigued, uh, there's changes in healing, positioning. Um, some people are on medications that they're concerned about uh, being on while breastfeeding. Um, sometimes it's just really challenging to get in and out of bed at night often. Um, and so these are all things that need to be put together when deciding surrounding feeding the baby. Um, support is really key. So uh, we do try to, uh, for, for women who are planning on breastfeeding, to get them in touch with lactation uh, consultants even prior to delivery. And then really, uh, creating a plan for them that, that works for them. And their breastfeeding goals may be no breastfeeding. It may be exclusive breastfeeding. It may be a combination of you know, breastfeeding during the daytime hours. However, then their partner bottle feeds the baby at night because that's what makes sense most for their family. And in the end, uh, the key is to just be uh, supportive for that and provide with options. So in summary, um, there's limited information. So we need to do more research and we need to learn more so that we can provide better care. Um, but it does appear that there is an increased risk of preterm birth. Uh, there's a risk of worsening mobility and falls. Uh, there's this, this clinical overlap that we really need to consider if people are presenting with high blood pressure and headaches between shunt malfunction, autonomic dysreflexia and preeclampsia. Uh, we have to be uh, monitoring for and treating uh, bladder infections. Uh, and in terms of birth planning, we need to be working with a multidisciplinary team. Um, some of the big gaps that we discovered from doing this big review is that there's no information available on the effect of pregnancy on continence. And this is a major question for many people. Um, there's no literature specifically on breastfeeding in the context of spina bifida. So we have information surrounding breastfeeding for women with physical disabilities, but not specifically tuned to people with spina bifida. Um, we need more research uh, to learn about the incidence and cause of preterm birth. So what is really driving that? Um, and we just wanna know more and we need to know more about other pregnancy concerns such as gestational diabetes, uh, preeclampsia, uh, malpresentation, meaning babies being um, bum down instead of head down um, and different postpartum complications and, and people with spina bifida. So we have a lot of people who have written in saying they're planning a pregnancy and what, what should we be doing next? Uh, so I recommend starting on the four to five milligrams of folic acid daily, um, likely in, and preferably three months before uh, you become pregnant. So there is a prescription uh, available uh, uh, prenatal vitamin uh, that has five milligrams of folic acid. You do not need to use a prescription based one. You can take a standard prenatal vitamin, see how much folic acid is in it, and then just take extra folic acid tablets to, to add up to the four to five milligrams. So that's okay to do too. Um, if you're thinking about pregnancy, you know, again, I can't say it enough, you know, the preconceptual counseling can be really helpful. Um, I put the link there uh, for our uh, specific clinic, if you happen to be in Toronto. Otherwise, you know, talk to your family doctor or whoever you're seeing about uh, seeing a maternal fetal medicine specialist or a perinatologist. Um, or an obstetrician about pre-pregnancy planning. 
Um, if you use seizure medications, talk to your neurologist or the person prescribing those uh, to try to consolidate to um, a single medication if possible um, and trying to get you in a good position for uh, best control of your seizures. And if you have decreased kidney function, talk to your nephrologist. I put some resources here. Um, the Center for Independent Living in Toronto has a disability and parenting network, which is really good. Um, they also can help people organize direct funding, which is a resource where if you are someone who qualifies uh, for an attendant in your home, then you would also qualify for a nurturing assistant, which is someone who can help with some of the physical tasks of parenting. So it's intended to assist with parenting tasks. Um, I also put up a website of a former patient of mine. Uh, this is for only uh, people who are parents with physical disabilities. It is not a place for a clinician. So I'm not on this Facebook group, but some people find it, find it helpful. And she was uh, uh, very happy to put that up and create that as a resource um, for other individuals. Um, and then the Tetra Society, uh, which is a group that creates adaptable um, uh, uh, furniture uh, and uh, parenting uh, needs for people with physical disabilities. Um, I also put up some of the guidelines here. So the first one uh, and the two guidelines at the top are available through the Spina Bifida Association. So one is on prenatal counseling um, and the other is the Women's Health Guidelines. So you can go to the Spina Bifida Association website and they're all available there. Um, there's also, uh, it's coming out in uh, July, but it's available online right now uh, through the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology Canada. We have um, a labor delivery and postpartum care for people with physical disabilities. Um, and so that's a, a good resource as well. Um, I'm just going to, before I take questions, because I saw so many coming through about, about birth, I just wanted to do a quick sort of rundown to touch base on that, because I can see this is a really important topic. Um, this is a, a visual summary of what happens when people come through the accessible care uh, pregnancy clinic. Up at the top, you can see uh, Liz Jung, who is uh, the advanced practice nurse that I work with, who's talking to someone on the phone. Um, we, whenever someone comes into our clinic, we touch base with them beforehand to make sure if we need any equipment to make their, uh, their visit better. Uh, we have it available, we know a little bit about them and if they have any attendants that are coming with them. Um, we try to organize our uh, day in conjunction with, uh, with Wheeltrans. We, we understand that the booking through that can be challenging. So uh, we try to fit everything in uh, with their, with their wheel trans appointment. Um, after people check into our clinic, uh, we have ultrasound at the same uh, location as we have the clinic. So it's in just sort of parallel hallways. And our sonographers uh, are quite experienced in scanning people with physical disabilities um, and sometimes scan people in the wheelchair if that's appropriate for uh, both parties and for the type of scan that's, that's being done. Um, then we create a plan of care that's personalized to that individual. So you can see there's that, the woman in the middle um, with her lovely baby. And we have a number of individuals who are just fantastic uh, that I know I can always call upon to assist uh, and be great referrals uh, for uh, people who come through the accessibility clinic. Some people need to see the respirologist, they need to see a neurologist, a pain clinician. Um, anesthesia, pretty much everyone has a conversation with anesthesia, urogynecology, um, endocrinology, hematology. So I have this group of amazing people um, who are really involved uh, in the clinic and making for really great interdisciplinary care. Um, the picture of the people around the table, I'm trying to illustrate how we all sit together and make a plan. Uh, and a key feature of what we do is in the third trimester, uh, we all sit down together. So any of the clinicians who have been involved in the care, as well as the pregnant person and their partner. We have a big meeting all together to talk about what's gonna happen around birth. And we talk about plan A and plan B, and if there's any you know, equipment we need to have available. Um, and we just try to make sure that everyone's on the same page and there's really good communication um, from all the team members. And we've all talked about our concerns and then we have a baby. So uh, this is just an illustration of what happens in our ultrasound uh, room. Uh, so here you can see a Hoyer lift off to the side, but we actually now have a ceiling lift, which is really great. Um, and again, this is all in the same space as our clinic space. Um, and we really want to make sure that we're, we're prepared. We have extra long booking times. Um, if people uh, need them to make sure that everyone's feeling comfortable and no one's being rushed. 
Um, and uh, we try to make sure that everyone's involved. A lot of people find having their partner uh, involved is also um, uh, a really important part of the experience. These pictures were taken pre-COVID, so you'll see that you know many of them people are not uh, social distancing or wearing masks. Um, this is our accessible birthing suite, so it's really big. Um, I'm trying to illustrate that in this in this picture with some of our smiling and wonderful birth unit nurses. Um, this space is big enough to hold uh, mobility equipment, and it also has a, a wheel-in uh, washroom, um, so it's a, a good space uh, to use. One of the, the key components uh, of the care is that, you know, regardless of which way you have a baby, it's still a birthday party and we still want to keep the family together and involved as possible. Um, this is uh, a picture um, of uh, someone who needed to have a general anesthesia uh, for her birth. And you can see the gentleman off to the side wearing the black mask and that's her partner. And uh, we have partners come into the operating room um, to especially help with positioning. Um, and uh, be there for their partner uh, before they go to sleep. Um, we find that having that partner there is really great, both from a person-centered care and family-centered care perspective, uh, but partners and uh, are usually used to working um, with the pregnant person in terms of being comfortable and being in a comfortable position. So if we're setting someone up for, for a cesarean section where they might be on the table for you know perhaps 45 minutes or an hour, we can make sure that we've uh, position them in a way that we know their body is going to be comfortable and their partners helped us with that. Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an obstetrician, we deliver lots of babies, so I always have to put a good birth picture in there. Um, for people who need to be asleep during their birth, um, we usually will arrange uh, for photographs or videos to be taken of their birth so that they'll have that, that documented for them for afterwards, unless it's a particularly cute baby. Um, we also provide breastfeeding support after delivery, but also before delivery. So many people will meet with a lactation consultant um, who will help them practice with weighted dolls to find comfortable positions for breastfeeding. So if there's someone who's choosing to breastfeed, we try to provide all of that support for them. And this is just some lovely pictures of uh, people who um, have come through our clinic and have had lovely babies. And this is pictures of them caring for their babies, um, feeding their babies and snuggling their babies. Um, and uh, some very happy families. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that this was informative and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Brundle. This was a very informative presentation and we have several questions. So um, we're gonna start by doing three questions in English and then we'll switch to three questions in, um, from the French side. Um, you don't have to answer in French. <laughs> they oh, will interpret you. it for you. Uh, <laughs> so let's start with um, this question. Is it routine to send spina bifida mothers for a BPP ultrasound after 34 weeks with the concerns with maternal breathing difficulties, fetal growth restriction? Would it be concerning if the movement parameter was graded as zero if the study was limited due to those factors? Okay, so, so the question I'm understanding is about uh, monitoring, so a biophysical profile of BPP, which is a, uh, an ultrasound study, and would this be something that we would be doing uh, routinely uh, for people after 35, 34 weeks in people with spina bifida? So I'll answer that, that piece first. So um, the uh, most, if you're looking at the general guidelines, uh, for pregnancy monitoring, you don't necessarily have to be having an ultrasound other than two main ultrasounds, which would be your 12 week scan and a 20 week scan. And then if someone is going overdue, then we will do more ultrasounds as well. If someone is having breathing concerns, if there's respiratory concerns, we often would check in on the baby more frequently as we would for a number of other health concerns. So people who have, um, you know, for example, if you have a kidney problem, um, people who are on different medications, um, you know, often if you're over 40, there's a lot of different reasons why someone might have extra scans. Um, and they're, they're really quite, quite great in terms of the different reasons. If someone was having respiratory concerns, I think it would make sense to check in on, on the baby more frequently. Um, and if there was no movement, so if they got a zero on that, I would myself be quite concerned about a zero for movement on a biophysical profile, and that would need follow-up. 
Okay. That answers the question. It's hard sometimes because there's so much context that's content. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this next question is pretty uh, a lot more simple. If you use a uh, metrofenoff, how does pregnancy affect clean intermittent catheterization? So, you know, to be honest with that, I would probably be referring and, and working with the, the surgeon who performed the surgery for that person. Um, I think that usually the concern is more about overall, um, you know, is there going to be an obstruction with the growing uterus, but I wouldn't be able to give you information about, about the cleaning of it. Okay. Um, and my next question is, are there many spina bifida informed pregnancy clinics available in Alberta that you can recommend? So I don't know of any in particular. Um, however, the, the best resource would likely be to go uh, and get a consultation um, from a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So there are people um, who do have more and less interest in different areas of maternal fetal medicine. Um, and so if you uh, ask for a referral for someone in maternal fetal medicine, it's not a huge group of people. There's probably, you know, at this point, 120 of us in, in Canada, um, they will be able to direct you to the right person. Um, but the major, uh, you know, tertiary care hospitals in Alberta would have someone who'd be able to assist you with that. What is the reported risk of spina bifida in newborns born to moms with spina bifida? So it depends on um, what the what the rate is that you're looking at, but it appears to be uh, between two to four percent. Um, however, if you're supplementing with the high uh, dose folic acid beforehand, it appears to decrease that risk by about 70. When discussing preterm labor being 34 to 37 weeks, this is not considered being induced, right? Along with 37 weeks plus considered term, this does not include being induced. Sorry, what are the reasons that someone would be induced? Okay, so so that the increased rate is a, it's an increased risk of going into labor um, early. However, if there are other concerns, such as someone who's having significant respiratory concerns or they develop preeclampsia, those might be reasons to make a decision about delivering early. Um, but the concern is more about preterm labor. Um, so that would be different than being induced. So there's two different, I think that's very a very good question because there are different reasons why you might have a baby early. So one might be your body goes into labor or your water breaks, and the other is something is happening. That means that it's at that point in time, it appears safer to have the baby at that gestational age than to wait any longer. Um, so I, I think that, I hope that answers that question. And then the second part of it, sorry, was about at term, do you need to be induced? Or if you would mind just repeating the second half? Sure. I just have to find it again, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Um... It says along with 37 weeks plus, is this considered term and would you be induced at that point? So 37 weeks would be considered term. And if all else is well, um, then 37 weeks is usually not a time frame for induction. So again, um, but if someone had high blood pressure, if there are worries about the baby's well being, if there's other, um, other concerns, then that would be considered a term induction. Um, in terms of when should someone with spina bifida have their baby, if all else is well, they're feeling well, the baby is well, um, they're not having any health concerns, their blood pressure is good, um, then usually you can just wait for spontaneous labor. Um, and then we would follow our standard guidelines for, for induction, which would be right now, we recommend an induction if you go uh, past 41 weeks for an induction between 41 weeks and 41 weeks and three days. So we would just be following our standard uh, induction guideline. What is the best delivery option for a woman with spina bifida, C-section or natural? I think you mentioned this in your presentation, but if you could just reiterate, that would be great. Sure. So, and I, I think that's a really good question. I think it's probably a question that, that people ask me right at the beginning often in their pregnancy, you know, what should I do? And, um, you know, in the end, I think we need to take into account all of those different uh, considerations. Um, you know, from a health perspective, what makes best sense for them, um, from a control perspective. So some people 
feel more comfortable with one or another because to them that feels like a more controlled scenario. And you know, to be honest, that's very different from person to person. So some people feel a vaginal delivery is a more controlled scenario and some people feel a C-section is a more controlled scenario. Um, and then of course that person's choices and feelings. So, um, you know, there are uh, some people who say, I would like a C-section for X, Y, Z reason. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to do that for them if they feel well informed about what that means, what recovery is like, and um, you know, what, what the risks of the surgery are. Uh, and in the same way, if someone says, I want to, I want to trial and vaginal delivery, then I say, that's great. You know, these are the, the risks and benefits of that situation as well. Um, often it's sort of an evolving conversation as more is learned about their pregnancy. So for example, um, you know, if uh, someone feels uh, very uncomfortable about the idea of laboring without access to an epidural, and that might be the key piece for them about making a decision. And then if they meet with anesthesia and anesthesia says, sure, I think we can, we can get good pain control for you during your labor. They might say, that sounds great. Um, I like that idea. Let's go for a trial of vaginal delivery. Um, if the idea of an emergency where they have to have an emergency intubation is very, the most concerning thing to that person, if for example, they don't have access to epidural and they don't want to labor without an epidural, that person might say, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of an emergency intubation, um, or I'm very worried about my previous surgeries and in an emergency scenario um, of having damage to that. I prefer a planned uh, cesarean section because it makes me feel more comfortable um, with how my body is going to respond to that. So it's, it's really quite an individual um, a decision. Uh, and we, we take into account all of those, all of those factors, healing, you know, their personal preferences, how they're going to um, feel about it, um, anesthesia options for them, um, and how it might impact their body. Okay. Um, I have corrected spina bifida at the age of four in Germany. I don't think I have a shunt, but instead a metal plate in the lower back. Would I be able to have an epidural if I were to have a natural birth? So I think for, for that really specific question, I think speaking to an anesthetist would be the right thing to do because they would be the, uh, the person who would be providing that, uh, the epidural uh, analgesia for you. Um, and so a consultation with them, if they could examine you and talk to you um, about your previous surgeries, they would be able to answer that for you. Okay. Um... I'm going to keep going through the, the English questions and then we're going to switch to French and um, see if we can get this figured out here. Um, next question. Does having spina bifida decrease any chances of becoming pregnant? So it doesn't appear to change your fertility. Um, some people, uh, if your uterus, um, some people with spina bifida are more likely to have what's called a malarian abnormality, which means instead of having a uterus that shapes sort of like a, like a pear, there can be pieces of the uterus that dive in and make it a heart shaped uterus, um, or have a bicornuate uterus, which is like two horns, or some people, they have a membrane that can hang down in the middle in the uterus. So there's many people who have this. Um, it's not something that's unique to the spina bifida community, but people with spina bifida are just more likely to have this type of, of uterus than um, someone without spina bifida. Um, in terms of fertility, people who have that, just that thin membrane down the middle, um, that uh, does appear to impact fertility because it's very challenging for the embryo to implant it if it's a very thin little membrane that's there. Um, but otherwise there should not, um, there doesn't appear to be a change in fertility. Okay. Um, this is from a person who has a shunt that is broken and disconnected. Um, they have very little support and are looking for answers. Do you recommend having a baby with a broken shunt or should they have it removed or um, revised before um, taking any actions with pregnancy? So I think this would probably be um, a, a good idea to speak to the neurosurgeon who uh, performed the initial surgery um, or to get in contact with a new neurosurgeon to see how how functioning the shunt is and what its role is playing. Um, you know, if it's something that is of benefit to you and you need to have it revised, it's probably better to just make sure you're in your, in your best health before becoming pregnant. So it's not something that you need to have done during your pregnancy. Um, but, you know, really, I think this is something that you need to speak to the, the neurosurgeon about how, 
how necessary and needed it is because some people, they have a, a shunting that's not functioning, but it's not impacting their, their life. Okay, um, just looking for the next question here. Um, we know that there is a lot of evidence on, and on continence outcomes in spina bifida, but what is your experience with changes in continence after pregnancy? So I think I think that's the one of the big questions that um, that we need to that we need to be looking more into. Um, the hard part is that um, I usually only see people about six weeks after they deliver, um, where it's very common that many women still have some uh, challenges with incontinence uh, after delivery, um, and that's just the function of being a being an obstetrician that I don't follow people long term in terms of what happens to their continence. Um, I know that there are a lot of worries about that, of course, because, you know, continence is so, so important to quality of life. Um, I think right now we can't say if one mode of delivery or the other uh, is going to be changing uh, the risk of, of uh, incontinence in the future. Um, from the urologist colleagues, um, right now they're not necessarily recommending that you have to have a C-section um, necessarily to preserve uh, continence. Um, unless you've had a urethral procedure. So if it's a procedure on the urethra itself, um, then uh, the recommendation um, at this point in time is to have a C-section to preserve that, but not necessarily for other, uh, um, for other types of continence procedures. Um, overall, people who have vaginal deliveries are more at risk of having incontinence in the future. And overall, anyone who's been pregnant has an increased risk of incontinence. Um, in the future, just from having that baby sit on your pelvic floor um, for a period of time. Um, is it worse for, for people with spina bifida? Um, you know, I think that we don't have the data right now to, to know how much that changes. Uh, would I be surprised if it was worsened by pregnancy? I wouldn't be surprised, but how long lasting is that? Um, I don't know. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, I am a prenatal and postpartum doula in Ottawa. I'm taking this presentation to be, to be better able to assist all women and partners at their birth. Um, sorry, that's not for you. That's for the attendees, my apologies. <laughs> um, I had a question um, regarding the indwelling catheter. Does that often cause more UTIs? Yes, yes. And I, I think, and that's a, I think it's a major, it's a major challenge because some people find that if they're doing it intermittent catheterization, um, it if, it be if it's becoming more and more challenging or they're needing to do it more frequently, um, or some people just are technically finding it hard to do as their belly gets bigger and bigger, that it's, that it's a harder uh, process. Um, some people decide that they, they do need one right at the end, um, but then you're sort of in a, in a position where we're, we're quite worried about the risk of bladder infection. So we should be screening um, frequently for bladder infections and paying attention to any symptoms. Could you just highlight again um, why individuals with spina bifida go into labor early? So, so we don't know. You know, I, I think that there's speculation as that there are risk factors that appear to um, would would make sense as to why people with spina bifida uh, go into labor early, um, but we don't know yet if those are actually the, the reasons behind it. Um, so it's felt that, you know, it may be associated with the increased risk of kidney infections, because we know that people with spina bifida are more likely to have kidney infections, secondary to the, the increased risk of bladder infections, um, and kidney infections increase the risk of preterm birth. Um, also, people with spina bifida are more likely to have malarian abnormality, so that that's change in the shape of the uterus that can predispose as well to preterm birth. So these are just, these are thoughts that it may make sense that these are reasons why people uh, with spina bifida are more likely to have preterm birth, but we don't know yet if that is actually the reason or not. It would be good to know if that actually was the reason or not, because although we can't change the malaria abnormality aspect, um, maybe there's something we can do from the bladder infection perspective um, that may be an effective intervention to decrease that risk. So, you know, right now these are, these are thoughts that make sense, but we can't say that for sure this is the reason why people with spina bifida have preterm birth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brindle. This has been a very interesting and informative presentation, and um, we will forward all of the French questions to you and um, get those answered. And um, 
hopefully for our next uh, presentation, we'll get all the, the um, kicks worked out and uh, we'll be on track. Thank you again so very much. This Thank was, you. This is great. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Take care. Bye, everyone.